Gamil Al-Batauti was a pilot for Egypt Air, his home country's national airline, and a former officer for the Egyptian Air Force. He came from a socially elite family in Egypt. His father was a mayor and a landowner, and his family members were well-educated and affluent. Al-Batauti was married and had five children. The youngest, Aya, who was 10 at the crash, suffered from lupus and was undergoing medical treatment in Los Angeles. Efforts had been made at Egypt Air, both at a company level and at an employee level, to help defray the medical expenses. Al Batauti was approaching retirement. Aviation regulations prevented him from flying as a commercial airline pilot after age 60, and had planned to split his time between a 10 bedroom villa outside of Cairo and a beach house near El Alamein. Al Batauti had been drafted into the Egyptian army, where he was trained as a pilot and flight instructor. He then worked for a time as an instructor at the Egyptian Air Institute. One colleague described his position there as high profile. While in the army, Al Batauti served as a pilot in both the 1967 Six Day War and the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Al Batuti hired on with Egypt Air on September 8, 1987. He held type ratings for the Boeing 737 200. Boeing 767-200, and the 767-300. At the time of the crash, he had logged 12,538 hours of flight time, with 5,755 as a pilot in command and 5,191 in the 767. At the time of his death, Al Batauti was the most senior first officer flying the 767 at Egypt Air. He was not promoted to captain because he declined to sit for the exam for his air transport pilot rating. The ATP study materials and exam are conducted in English, the international language of aviation, and Al Batauti did not have sufficient English proficiency. Once he reached 55, the possibility of promotion was further hindered by Egypt Air policy which prevented promotions after that age. According to statements made by his colleagues to the NTSB during the Flight 990 investigation, he did not want to be promoted, because as senior F.O., he could get his preferred flight schedules, which assisted in his family situation. Despite not being promoted to captain, he was often referred to by that title because of his previous experience at the Egypt Air Institute. Batauti was also the co-pilot that the National Transportation Safety Board suspected of deliberately crashing Flight 990 into the ocean, an assertion denied by Egyptian authorities. According to the NTSB, Batauti seized the plane's controls and turned off the autopilot after the cockpit captain left. He then led the plane into a dive, continually repeating, I rely on God. The pilot then came back into the cockpit, tried to stop the dive, but could not prevent the plane from crashing into the ocean. Some investigators learned that he was supposedly reprimanded for inappropriate behavior with female guests at the Hotel Pennsylvania, a New York City hotel often used by Egypt Air crews. Hatim Rushdie, an Egypt Air official, said to be responsible for the alleged reprimand was a passenger on Flight 990. The details of the reprimand included the removal of Gamil al Batoudi's privilege of flying any flight to the United States, and that Flight 990 would be his last. There was Western media speculation that Batouti may have been a terrorist, his family and friends indicated no strong political beliefs. The Egyptian Civil Aviation Authority disputes the cause of the crash, blaming technical problems rather than any action of al Batouti. Egypt Air Flight 990 was a regularly scheduled Los Angeles-New York-Cairo flight. On October 31, 1999, at around 1.50 a.m. Flight 990 dived into the Atlantic Ocean, about 60 miles south of Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, in international waters, killing all 217 people on board. Flight 990 was being flown in a Boeing 767 aircraft, named Tuthmosis III, after a pharaoh from the 18th dynasty. The flight carried 14 crew members and 203 passengers from seven countries, Canada, Egypt, Germany, Sudan, Syria, United States, and Zimbabwe. Included in the passenger manifest were over 30 Egyptian military officers. Among them were two brigadier generals, a colonel, a major, and four other Air Force officers. Censors prevented newspapers in Cairo from reporting the office's presence on the flight. Flight 990 was crewed by 14 people, 10 flight attendants, and 4 flight crew members. 
The flight required two complete flight crews, each consisting of one captain and one first officer, because of the scheduled flight time. Egypt Air designated one crew as the active crew, and the other as the cruise crew, or the relief crew. It was customary for the active crew to make the takeoff and fly the first four to five hours. The cruise crew then assumed control of the aircraft until about one to two hours before landing, at which point the active crew returned to the cockpit and assumed control of the airplane. Egypt Air designated the captain of the active crew as the commander of the flight. The active crew consisted of Captain Mahmoud El Habashi and First Officer Adil Anwar, and the cruise crew were Captain Anwar El Sayed and First Officer Gamil Al Batouti. U.S. air traffic controllers provide transatlantic flight control operations as a part of the New York Center. The airspace is divided into areas, and Area F was the section that oversaw the airspace through which Flight 990 was flying. Transatlantic commercial air traffic travels via a system of routes called North Atlantic Tracks, and Flight 990 was the only aircraft at the time assigned to fly North Atlantic Track Zulu. Several military operations areas over the Atlantic, called warning areas, are also monitored by the New York Center. Still, records show that these were inactive the night of the accident. Interaction between ZNY and Flight 990 was completely routine. After takeoff, Flight 990 was handled by three different controllers as it climbed up in stages to its assigned cruising altitude. Like all commercial airliners, the aircraft was equipped with a Mode C transponder, which automatically reported the plane's altitude when queried by the ATC radar. At 1.44, the transponder indicated that Flight 990 had leveled off at FL-330. Three minutes later, the controller requested that Flight 990 switch communications radio frequencies for better reception. A pilot on Flight 990 acknowledged the new frequency. This was the last transmission received from Flight 990. In a span of 36 seconds, the plane dropped 14,600 feet, nearly 3 miles. Several subsequent primary returns, simple radar reflections without the encoded mode C altitude information, were received by ATC, the last being at 0652.05. At 6.54, the ATC controller tried notifying Flight 990 that radar contact had been lost but received no reply. Two minutes later, the controller contacted ARINC to determine if Flight 990 had switched to an oceanic frequency too early. ARINC attempted to contact Flight 990 on SCLCAL, also with no response. The controller then contacted a nearby aircraft, Lufthansa Flight 499, asking it to see if it could raise Flight 990. The German carrier responded that it had no radio contact and was not receiving any ELT signals. Air France Flight 439 was asked to overfly the last known position of Flight 990 but reported nothing out of the ordinary. The center also provided coordinates of Flight 990's last known position to Coast Guard rescue aircraft. Flight data showed that the flight controls were used to move the elevators to initiate and sustain the steep dive. The flight deviated from its assigned altitude of 33,000 feet and dove to 16,000 feet over 44 seconds, then climbed to 24,000 and began a final dive, hitting the Atlantic Ocean about two and a half minutes after leaving FL-330. Radar and radio contact was lost 30 minutes after the aircraft departed JFK Airport in New York on its flight to Cairo. The cockpit voice recorder recorded the first officer repeating, I rely on God, 11 times while the captain repeatedly asked during the dive, what is this? There were no other aircraft in the area. There was no indication that an explosion occurred on board. The engines normally operated for the entire flight until they shut down, and the left engine was torn from the wing from the stress of the maneuvers. Search and rescue operations were launched within minutes of the loss of radar contact, with the bulk of the operation being conducted by the United States Coast Guard. At 3 a.m., an Hu-25 Falcon jet took off from Airbase Cape Cod, Mass., becoming the first rescue party to reach the plane's last known position. All USCG cutters in the area were immediately diverted to search for the aircraft. An urgent marine information broadcast was issued, requesting mariners in the area to keep a lookout for the downed aircraft. At sunrise, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy training vessel King's Pointer found an oil sheen and some small pieces of debris. 
Rescue efforts continued by air and by sea, with a group of USCG cutters covering 10,000 square miles on October 31 with the hope of locating survivors. However, all that could be recovered was a single body in the debris field. Atlantic strike team members brought two truckloads of equipment from Fort Dix to Newport to set up an incident command post. Officials from the Navy and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration were dispatched to join the command. The search and rescue operation was eventually suspended on November 1, 1999, with the rescue vessels and aircraft moving instead to recovery operations. These operations were ceased when the naval vessels USS Grapple and USNS Mohawk, and the NOAA research vessel Whiting arrived to take over salvage efforts, including recovery of the bulk of the wreckage the seabed. AC-130, an H-60 helicopter, the Hu-25 Falcon and the Cutter's USCGC Monomoy, USCGC Spencer, USCG Reliance, USCG Bainbridge Island, USCG Juniper, USCG Point Highland USCG Chinook, and USCG Hammerhead, along with their supporting helicopters, participated in the search. A second salvage effort was made in March 2000 that recovered the aircraft's second engine and some of the cockpit controls. Investigation Under the International Civil Aviation Organization Treaty, the investigation of an airplane crash in international waters is under the country of registry of the aircraft. At the request of the Egyptian government, the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board took the lead in this investigation, with the Egyptian Civil Aviation Authority participating. The Federal Aviation Administration supported the investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the United States Coast Guard, the U.S. Department of Defense, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Boeing Commercial Airplanes, Egypt Air, and Pratt Whitney Aircraft Engines. Two weeks after the crash, the NTSB proposed declaring a criminal event and handing the investigation over to the FBI. Egyptian government officials protested, and Omar Suleiman, head of Egyptian intelligence, traveled to Washington to investigate. In February 2000, Egypt Air 767 Captain Hamdi Hanafi Taha sought political asylum in London after landing his aircraft. In his statement to British authorities, he claimed to know the circumstances behind the crash of Flight 990. He is reported to have said that he wanted to stop all lies about the disaster and to put much of the blame on Egypt Air management. The reaction was swift, with the NTSB and FBI sending officials to interview Taha and Osama El Baz, an advisor to Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, saying, this pilot can't know anything about the plane, the chances that he has any information about the crash of Flight 990 are very slim. Egypt Air officials also immediately dismissed Taha's claim. Taha's information was reported of little use to the investigators, and his asylum application was turned down. The NTSB's final report was issued on March 21, 2002, after a two-year investigation. Their conclusion was. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the Egypt Air Flight 990 accident is the airplane's departure from normal cruise flight and subsequent impact with the Atlantic Ocean due to the relief first officer's flight control inputs. The reason for the relief first officer's actions was not determined. The ECAA final report, based largely on the NTSBs, came to distinctly different conclusions. 1. The relief first officer did not deliberately dive the airplane into the ocean. Nowhere in the 1,665 pages of the NTSB's docket or the 18 months of investigative effort is there any evidence to support the so-called deliberate act theory. In fact, the record contains specific evidence refuting such a theory, including an expert evaluation by Dr. Adol Fowit, a highly experienced psychiatrist. 2. There is evidence pointing to a mechanical defect in the elevator control system of the accident. The best evidence of this is the shearing of certain rivets in two of the right elevator bell cranks and the shearing of an internal pin in a power control actuator attached to the right elevator. Although this evidence, combined with certain data from the flight data recorder, points to a mechanical cause for the accident, reaching a definitive conclusion at this point is not possible because of the complexity of the elevator system, the lack of reliable data from Boeing, and the limitations of the simulation and ground tests conducted after the accident. 
Additional evidence of relevant Boeing 767 elevator malfunctions in Aero Mexico, February 2000, Gulf Air, and American Airlines, March 2001. There were also two incidents on a United Airlines airplane in 1994 and 1996. 3. Investigators cannot rule out the possibility that the RFO may have taken emergency action to avoid a collision with an unknown object. Although plausible, this theory cannot be tested because the United States has refused to release certain radar calibration and test data that are necessary to evaluate various unidentified radar returns in the vicinity of Flight 990. The investigation and its results drew criticism from the Egyptian government, which advanced several alternative theories about the mechanical malfunction of the aircraft. In Western countries, the Egyptian rejection of the NTSB report was attributed to a strong Egyptian cultural aversion to suicide. The NTSB tested the theories proposed by Egyptian authorities, and none were found to match the facts. For example, an elevator assembly hard over, in which the elevator in a fully extended position sticks because the hinge catches on the tailframe, proposed by the Egyptians was discounted because the flight recorder data showed the elevator was in a split condition. In this state, one side of the elevator is up and the other down. On the 767, this condition is only possible through flight control input, e.g., one yoke is pushed forward, the other pulled backward. Nevertheless, the investigation is commonly held to have reached incorrect conclusions, especially but not only in Egypt. Many Egyptians are convinced that sabotage is the likeliest cause of the crash of a flight carrying 33 Egyptian army officers. Another theory proposes that the aircraft was passing through a military zone without proper coordination and suffered electromagnetic interference. While the official investigation was proceeding, speculation about the crash ran rampant in Western media and the Egyptian press. Long before the NTSB had issued its final report, Western media began to speculate about the meaning of the taped cockpit conversations and possible motives, including suicide and terrorism, behind al Bataudi's actions on the flight. The speculation, in part, was based on leaks from an unnamed federal law enforcement official that the crew member in the co-pilot's seat was recorded as saying, I made my decision now. I put my faith in God's hands. During a press conference held on November 19, 1999, the NTSB's Jim Hall denounced such speculation and said that it had done a disservice to the long-standing friendship between the people of the United States of America and Egypt. On November 20, 1999, the Associated Press quoted senior American officials as saying that the quote was not, in fact, on the tape. It is believed that the speculation arose from a mistranslation of an Egyptian Arabic phrase meaning, I rely on God. London Sunday Times, quoting unnamed sources, speculated that al Batauti had been traumatized by war, and was depressed because much of his fighter squadron in the 1973 war had been killed. Egyptian Media Reaction and Speculation The Egyptian media reacted in outrage to the speculations in the Western press. The state-owned Al-Aram, Al-Masai called al Batauti a martyr, and the Islamist al Shab covered the story under a headline that stated, America's goal is to hide the truth by blaming the Egypt air pilot. At least two Egyptian newspapers, al Gomhuria and al Aram, offered theories that the U.S. accidentally shot down the aircraft. Other theories were advanced by the Egyptian press, including the Islamist al Shab, which speculated that a Mossad, CIA conspiracy was to blame, since, supposedly, Egypt air and el al crews stay at the same hotel in New York. Al Shab also accused U.S. officials of secretly recovering the FDR, reprogramming it, and throwing it back into the water to be publicly recovered. Unifying all the Egyptian press was a stridently held belief that it is inconceivable that a pilot would kill himself by crashing a jet with 217 people aboard. It is not possible that anyone who would commit suicide would also kill so many innocent people alongside him, said Ehab William a surgeon at Cairo's Anglo-American Hospital, reported the Cairo Times. The Egyptian media also reacted against Western speculation of terrorist connections. The Cairo Times reported, the deceased pilot's nephew, Walid al Batauti, has lashed out in particular against speculation that his uncle could have been a religious extremist. He loved the United States, the nephew said. If you wanted to go shopping in New York, he was the man to speak to because he knew all the stores. 
The family adopted Donald Duck as its emblem, and toy Donalds are scattered throughout the nephews and the uncles' houses. The story of the flight has been featured on the Discovery Channel Canada, National Geographic Television. In interviews conducted for the program, Al Bataudi's family members continue to dispute the suicide, deliberate crash theories and dismiss them as biased. Nevertheless, the program implies he crashed the plane for personal reasons, his boss had severely reprimanded him for sexual harassment, and this boss was actually on the plane. The dramatization of the crash also depicts Al Bataudi forcing the plane down with the pilot attempting to pull the plane up. Despite this, upon conclusion, the program stresses the official NTSB conclusion, which makes no mention of a suicide mission or a deliberate crash. Rather, it simply states that the crash was a direct result of actions made by the co-pilot. Washington, D.C. reported that the National Transportation Safety Board determined that the probable cause of the crash of Egypt Air Flight 990 was the airplane's departure from normal cruise flight and subsequent impact with the Atlantic Ocean due to the Relief First Officer's flight control inputs. The reason for the Relief First Officer's actions was not determined. Because the crash occurred in international waters, the Egyptian government was initially responsible for the investigation under Annex 13 to the Convention on International Civil Aviation. However, the Egyptian government delegated the conduct of the investigation to the NTSB under Annex 13. The investigation into the cause of the crash has been quite extensive. It has involved months of testing and research during which investigators evaluated various scenarios to determine the circumstances leading up to the crash.